You know, my name is Randy Hankin. I've been the executive director of the Seasetting Institute since 2012. We're a think tank. We're a nonprofit. We were founded here in Silicon Valley. And our mission is to better humanity uh, through creating new societies at sea. And uh, in a little bit, I'll tell you more about this floating city project that um, Greg has alluded to. Let's see. Um, so by show of hands, who heard of seasteading before today? OK, so many of you it's new. And for many of you, we'll find out whether what you've heard is congruent with what I'm going to tell you it is. Because there's um, one of the things I think is interesting about seasteading is people get a glimpse, and then they apply their own idea to it. And that's good. But there's a different thing that I might have been working on for the past few years. So I hope that my talk, um, I'm not going to be able to tell you everything in the short talk. So tomorrow morning, you can come to our workshop. And um, I hope that some of the things I say to you are novel, uh, possibly controversial, uh, and challenging from uh, the political to the environmental or technolo technological to humanitarian. And uh, I encourage you to engage with me uh, and go for this quick ride. And hopefully, we'll um, come out with some good questions on the other side. So um, there's been many visionaries and dreamers who have looked to the sea as uh, the next frontier for us. Uh, but it was our founder, Patry Friedman, uh, who said that uh, if we open the seas up as a new frontier to build new city states, to experiment with new institutions, we could unleash uh, limitless potential for humanity. And he's not the only person here in the valley that is thinking this way. Uh, Larry Page famously said, there are many exciting and important things you could do, but you just can't do because they're illegal or are not allowed by regulation. And that makes sense. We don't want our world to change too fast but we should set aside some small part of the world. I think as technologists, we should have some safe places where we can try out some new things and figure out what is the effect on society, what's the effect on people, without having to deploy it out into the normal world. So over the past few decades here in the Valley, uh, there's been several, you know, you know, thousands of startups launched, and, and several of whom have gone on and changed the world. Um, and consequently, these startups have generated billions of dollars of wealth and economic activity. And in fact, uh, some of these now have GDP, or their, um, their value, their revenue is bigger than the GDP of most of the countries on the earth, especially you know, Apple and Google. So um, how can we replicate these kind of successes that companies are having for governments? And we think the opportunity a lot relies in creating startup cities. And in our case, startup cities with their own jurisdictions at sea. Um, if our homes were on mobile platforms and they were floating, it would be like a jigsaw puzzle. And we could move ourselves from one location to another, assembling and reassembling at will. And um, this would give us opportunities where the cities, the governments, would compete for us like citizens, just as those companies compete for us like customers. Um, and in many ways, floating cities already do exist. They're called cruise ships. Um, if the cruise ship industry were a country, it would be, one, it'd be ranked as one of the uh, fastest in economic growth. And over the last 35 years, the cruise ship industry has grown twice the rate of the US GDP. Um, and it's not really the largest engineering jump to go from this picture here to this artist's rendition of a floating city based on a flower. So I know this sounds fanciful, and you know, we're comparing cruise ships to floating islands. And you might ask yourself, well, is that possible? And uh, well, in South Korea, they actually have built three floating islands that are based on flowers. They call it the seed, the bud, and the full bloom. Uh, it has a convention hall, restaurants, and arcades, and they're powered by solar and tidal energy. So a few years ago, we launched our floating city project uh, with the ambitious goal of developing the first seastead by 2020. And uh, that was a pivot for us from trying to encourage seasteading as something that was going to happen in international waters outside of other, uh, outside the jurisdiction of any government. We decided instead that we would uh, work with a host nation and, ma and make partners and try to locate the first seastead near shore in protected waters. So for the past couple of years, I spent most of my time uh, negotiating with potential host nations to welcome us into one of their harbor atolls to allow us to have a special jurisdiction uh, in exchange for them getting the economic, environmental, and social benefits that we would provide. 
So you might you know, go on on why we want to have a host nation. Uh, we think we can develop a seastead near shore with a few platforms for you know, tens of millions of dollars rather than being out in international water trying to use oil rig style platforms or cruise ship for billions of dollars. Um, it'll be easier for our residents and our, and our workers to access goods from an existing supply chain. And um, a seastead in territorial waters will allow us to fit into international law uh, rather than being out in international waters where we're carving our own way. So our first development, we expect we'll have hub businesses, most likely in tech, uh, ocean-based clean tech, aquaculture, and tourism. And then over time, we imagine this pilot community growing organically into a village and then a full-fledged city. We often say that we don't live on planet Earth, we live on planet ocean. And, and this is the view of the Pacific Ocean from space. We always hear that you know, the Earth is 70% water. You forget how big the Pacific Ocean actually is. Um, up there on the top left is Hawaii. Uh, on the right here we have New Zealand. Uh, way over to the left you can barely see the edges of the Americas. And smack dab in the middle, that's Tahiti uh, in French Polynesia. And because of international law, every nation is allowed 200 miles of their exclusive economic zone. And with that, the 118 islands of French Polynesia, French Polynesia is actually as big as Western Europe. Uh, but it's only 1% land. Um, and it's not as far away as it used to be. Um, it's 12 hours from Tokyo, six hours from New Zealand. And it took us eight hours to fly there from Los Angeles. So this was our view from our dinner table last month. Um, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right? It's, it's a good place to start imagining, you know, can, can the next prototyping the future conference be on our seastead? <laughs> it's uh, not raining there right now and, uh, and 75 degrees. So. Um, Earlier that day, we had met with the president of French Polynesia. So that's the, the back of the president's head. That's me giving the presentation. Uh, they had invited us down there to hear about whether seasteading could be a solution to their most pressing economic and environmental problems. Um, here's the president in the middle, uh, flanked by his ministers. Um, they asked us to submit this memorandum of understanding. Uh, we did that a few days later. Um, and uh, you know, we, uh, they met about the memorandum centering two days ago, and we are expecting to hear from them in a couple, they've invited us for another meeting in a couple weeks. So all signs are pointing that this is uh, moving forward. Um, you know, here's the president shaking hand with our team. Uh, there you can see Mr. Greg DeLon eagerly waiting to meet the president. Uh, we're now working together on identifying the technologies and partnerships that we're going to take with us to uh, create this first floating city in, um, off the coast of Tahiti. At the conclusion of our meeting with the president, uh, he said to us, it would be wonderful if we could work with the Sea Setting Institute to bring sustainable development and economic activity to French Polynesia. Let's create the future together. So what do I mean by a special jurisdiction? Um, does anybody here familiar with special economic zones? So um, are you also kind of familiar with this other idea of a special jurisdiction that uh, we see coming through the bay and they're very intimately familiar with down in, uh, in Tahiti? It's back to this cruise ship model. Um, in many ways, they're, they are de facto self-governing entities. They, uh, they fly the flag of one country, sail the seas of another. Um, they employ people from other countries and establish contract law and, and legal form in another country. Uh, and this ship here, the Paul Gonquin, which is named after, after a uh, famous painter who spent a considerable amount of his life in French Polynesia, um, it's flagged in the Bahamas. It sails from Fiji to Indonesia to French Polynesia. Uh, it's registered in the Cayman Islands in Delaware. Uh, the crew can be hired from outside of French Polynesia. Uh, they don't have to be obligated to French Polynesia employment laws. The captain of the ship is, has, uh, you know, f holds full executive powers while they're at sea. Uh, the medical staff on the ship are uh, independent contractors. Uh, bookings on the ship are paid in U.S. currency. Uh, and litigation between passengers and the company takes place in the jurisdiction of French Polynesia. So when we say to them, you know, we want to create a sea zone here, uh, we can piggyback on these kind of legal innovations to create a new legal innovation uh, with um, 
regulatory body that would be favorable to us, favorable to creating new businesses there. Um, I, these images here are from an um, architectural design contest that we hosted. Uh, these were all submitted by um, volunteers, uh, except for the one on the top right, which was done by our partners in the Netherlands. Um, I do want to go over some things that distinguish the cruise ship model from what we expect for seasteads. Um, you know, we expect that seasteading will result in more benefits to our host nation. Um, we're going to be more likely to use their services, their materials, their products, their facilities, you know, directly. Um, our, we'll be having, we'll have production on our seasteads rather than just consumption like on a cruise ship. Uh, seasteads will be platforms that grow and duplicate while, you know, ships, ships uh, cannot. Uh, seasteading uh, will create continuous work uh, for adapting and improvement of the technologies and business models employed on the platform. Uh, cruise ships are a business to customer uh, type model, whereas a seasteading is more of a peer to peer model. Uh, ships are inherently unsustainable way of operating, um, while Seastead's goal is to be sustainable, particularly when it comes to energy, water, and waste. Um, ships require a lot of maintenance. Uh, you have to take them out of the water every few years, scrub off the barnacles, repaint them, see if they're rusting through, and we plan to design our seasteads so they can last for a century or longer. Uh, and we also expect them to be good for sea life. So in 2012, we commissioned a feasibility study uh, from our partners in the Netherlands at, uh, and um, when we were doing that study at the time, we were thinking we are going to start the first seastead down in Honduras. The uh, study looked at the Gulf of Fonseca, which is a, ba a large body of water that uh, goes be um, uh, that borders El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Uh, so the study we did there isn't necessarily applicable to what we're going to do in the calm seas and the lagoons of French Polynesia, but at least gives us a jumping off point where we can speculate about costs for what we want to build. So these are our Dutch aquatic partners. Uh, that's Karina Bart and Rooker. Uh, Bart were with us on this last delegation. Um, and um, so when we were looking at the Gulf of Fonseca, we thought about using modular platforms with 50 meter sides in uh, squares or pentagons. And you can see here in this diagram how it gives you a really an unlimited way to put these things together and still have access to the water between the platforms, uh, which I'll show you is important for a few reasons in a moment. Um, we expected these squares to cost about $15 million a piece, and this would hold a, um, a three-story building on them, or three-story buildings, and could house 20 to 30 people each. Uh, and that would be about $500 per square foot of issuable space, which is competitive with major metropolises. Uh, at the same time, we started collecting data uh, passively through an online survey. Uh, thousands of people taking our survey saying they want to come live on the first seastead. More than half of them had said, um, yes, I can afford it. And of those half, um, you know, 60% are saying this $500 to $600 a square foot is reasonable for me. So it meets our target price uh, and it makes us feel uh, confident that there's a market for real estate on these seasteads. Um, our Dutch partners built this uh, famous floating pavilion in Rotterdam and it's an example of creating a floating architecture that's uh, sustainable and resilient to sea level rise. Um, so these images show the construction process. They used two and a half meters of uh, polystyrene uh, reinforced with steel and encased in concrete. Uh, they, the translucent shell is made out of a uh, plastic that's 100 times lighter than glass. They use air conditioning and heating provided by water and solar energy. And they, uh, the toilet water is pumped out of the river, uh, purified, and then put back into the river afterwards without any um, detrimental effects. Um, so I was mentioning a moment ago how it was important to have that extra space around the sea set so you're not just piling them in. And that's because we want to be able to catch, uh, let sunlight still penetrate uh, into the water so that the plants underneath us can photosynthesize. And one of my favorite hypotheses about taking our project to places in the tropic where there is coral bleaching happening is that we think we can cool the water in the lagoons. Uh, one of the major causes of coral bleaching is that the waters get hot and the coral die. So if we can strategically place our platforms there, we could keep the water cooler and allow the sea life, allow the coral to rejuvenate. 
Um, and then, of course, sea life likes being underneath floating things anyhow. If you've seen, um, you know, even these oil rigs that are floating out in the middle of nowhere, they they become havens for sea life. So we think that uh, this is going to be a, you know, a, a, a benefit uh, for sea life that's often hurt by human. Um, oh, also, so this slide shows that we calculate, or the Dutch calculate it, you know, optimal. Um, square footage of platforms depending upon the depth of the lagoon. So we're taking this type of thing into consideration. Um, and, and we're looking farther into the future. You know, the, uh, French Polynesia, that's our pilot project. But you know, as we just saw in, this, uh, in the Owl Eyes presentation, you know, what happens here in our bay when we're threatened? You know, what can we do so that we can stay close to the water? What if we can start building floating architecture right here that when the storm surges happen, we don't have to be flooded. Instead, we just rise up with it. And then additionally, how do we capture the pollutants that are coming out from land? Like one of the worst things that's happening in the ocean is the phosphorus that drains out from, uh, from agriculture. And we think that we can capture those nutrients and then reuse them as biofuels and, and feedstock for aquaculture. So, Here's the iconic overwater bungalows of French Polynesia. Uh, they are more beautiful in person, I promise you. It was stunning. To, like, you, know, you see them as a cartoon here, and then you go over and see them in real life. But we, um, we anticipate that our floating island would fit right in. Uh, this is a design for the pilot platform that uh, Bart made for us. Uh, it's influenced by the Tahitian landscape, including uh, a Tahitian flower. So if we get that memorandum of understanding uh, signed by the government in the coming weeks, uh, we will be spinning off a startup company that's going to plan and develop an innovative, sustainable floating islands, uh, beginning with two to three pilot platforms similar to what you're seeing here. Um, and we think these communities will be resilient to the effects of climate change and rising seas, and they'll offer significant regulatory and legal autonomy to our residents and businesses. So, we're starting to think of the Polynesians as the original seasteaders. Um, they move from one place to another, uh, creating new societies and discovering new ways of living together. Uh, just as Westerners moved west across the America, across the American frontier, uh, creating new societies that have changed the world and brought more freedom and prosperity than the hundreds of years before that, um, the Polynesians went across east across the. Uh, Pacific and created a wealth that's all their own. Uh, they traveled in these, this is an accurate replication of what they traveled in, these double canoes. They packed everything on it. They head out into the ocean, no map, no compass, you know, just, uh, I guess, faith that eventually they're going to, you know, hit land again. And uh, this evolutionary process of exit and choice uh, produced a beautiful culture. Um, this is Bora Bora. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's, it's a paradise. Um, but uh, there's a downside in French Polynesia. And that downside is that they're really in need of, uh, desperate need of economic development. There's 250,000 people there, yet they bring in uh, nearly $2 billion in subsidies from France. Um, the only major income is from tourism, and tourism is down 40% since the 2008 economic crash. Um, and they import 70% of their food, and their GDP is 70% government, which is comparable to Cuba. So, um, you know, remoteness there is a major challenge for them, but I think this is a huge opportunity for us to go down there and bring them some innovation and some new industries. So, you know, Polynesians, they have one product to sell, and that's paradise, uh, and they have an economic incentive to make it a paradise. Um, they are invested in keeping their seas pristine. Uh, they, they don't allow commercial fishing uh, they, for, for export. Um, so the sea life there is rich compared to elsewhere in the world. But nonetheless, they will be affected by rising seas and climate change. So the technologies for coping with rising sea levels all over the earth are intimately connected with economic and social development. And you all know better than me that it's the technological developments that you're working on that will allow us to be resilient to the threats of climate change. If we are successful launching seasteading in Tahiti, uh, we think that French Polynesia could become a leader in a brand new industry, exporting our technologies around the world. And this could, in turn, uh, transform Polynesians' brain drain into brain gain and their deficits into surpluses. 
So this is our concept that we can start in a protected lagoon and then as we improve our technologies and grow, eventually we will be able to go out and uh, seasteed on the high seas in international waters without the need for a host nation. So floating cities, beginning with the pilot we are planning today, uh, are an important answer to the pressing needs of French Polynesia and for every uh, low-lying coastal region in the world. This could be our world in 2050. Um, before I close, I want to plug this book. Uh, my coworker and colleague and friend Joe Quirk has written. It's coming out in March. Uh, if you like a little taste of what I had to say today, you'll really enjoy this book. Uh, he uh, really dives deep, uh, talks about eight aquapreneurs. That's what he likes to call entrepreneurs that are working on the, this ocean industry ideas. So the aquapreneurs are going to save us from uh, climate threats and other threats from, you'll, you'll learn about if you read the book. That'll be out in March, published by Simon & Schuster. Um, so, Take down my name if you'd like. Uh, hit me up. I'll hang around. I think if there's cocktails now or something, Greg. I don't. I don't know. Is there? Well, um, first of all, thank you to Randy. <laughs>